Uh, I'm really excited to bring this conversation to you. Um, I know we're all doing a lot of different things. You've heard of many technology presentations today earlier. There's going to be some after. Probably all technology out, um, largely because technology tends to mean there's going to be change in our lives. Um, and that sometimes is not always the easiest thing to deal with. Um, and a lot of the times it's maybe not the right thing to be dealing with. So our conversation, our panel today is going to be focusing a little bit about where we're at today, some of the challenges that we face with tech. Construction's a messy business. We have to collaborate with a lot of different stakeholders, some of which we can't even influence how they use their tech. So we're going to explore those challenges. We're going to explore some of the opportunities. Um, and we're going to see and dig into the different approaches you can take from building homegrown solutions to adopting technology and configuring it, um, kind of the risks and trade-offs that you face while you do that. Um, and then kind of where we start to see where the industry is heading um, and exploring different groups like CAMAM and how they're working together to influence how maybe we organize our data to get better interoperability. Um, my name is Nick, by the way. I'm from Avocado Construction Technology Services. And we help owners with those creative technology solutions they need to limit disruption and get the value out of their stack. Uh, but enough about me. Let me turn it over to our panel here and get started. Chris, you want to take us off? Sure, just intros. Just intros. Yep. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Curtis Wittick, and I'm a project director at Cook County's Bureau of Economic Development. Um, I appreciate the invitation to come to speak to you this afternoon. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, that's my current role, and happy to be here. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, Tom? Yeah. All right. Um, my name is Sean Guzik. I'm a licensed professional engineer, and I work for the Chicago Department of Transportation. I'm the chief materials engineer and quality assurance manager and uh, project lead for a lot of the software tools that we use both in construction and design to implement all of our uh, construction and design projects. Good afternoon. My name is Günther Preuss, and I'm with Answer Advisory. We're a consulting firm, program management, but also advisory services. I've been working in Chicago for the last 20 years on a number of large, complex construction programs, and for the last four years uh, with the Chicago Transit Authority. Thank you. So I think where we're going to jump in a little bit is start to explore some of the, the things that we're dealing with today in terms of working um, as in our pre-call. Um, Chris, I think we can jump in with you and talking a little bit about um, the challenges and fragmentation that we're experiencing um, in collaboration today. Sure, and I'll, I'll give a little more framing. So in my role at Cook County, I manage two ARPA programs, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act, and um, those two programs are both capital improvement projects related to lead abatement. So one is Lead Care Cook County, which is a, uh, a program to replace lead service lines in home-based child care providers, which is a small segment of the anticipated number of lead service lines we have. But it's a pilot program. It's a massive problem, you know, lead service lines, but we got to start somewhere. So we decided, or um, the, the, the program design predates me, but... The idea is to focus our limited funding on the highest, the, the most vulnerable populations. So um, young young kids, toddlers, um, and babies, of which I, I have a child in a daycare, so it's kind of personal for me. Um, and then the other program is a lead pipe removal project in which we're working with the Housing Authority of Cook County. Um, outside of that, I do work on some strategic planning initiatives for the Bureau of Economic Development, but I'll focus on the capital projects. Um, one other caveat is I'm new to Cook County. I've been here about six months. Um, before that, I was a project director, for, or excuse me, uh, director of planning for a civil engineering firm. Um, so with that context out of the way, I think some of the fragmentation that I, I, maybe I'll speak on my prior experience, you know, funding, as you as we know, kind of typically flows from federal to state to local and county to local. Each level has different requirements, different software, you know, platforms that they use, and it's oftentimes hard to coordinate across those scales. Um, for example, if I'm working on a local municipal roadway project, I, we have to coordinate with IDOT, and sometimes the, the, the systems just don't integrate as seamlessly as we would want. So that's one example. It's just jurisdictional um, levels and not and having 
disconnects as a result of that. And I think, Curtis, to your point there, each level has their own requirements. So me at the local agency level, I need the information in the most granular, detailed fashion. FHWA and IDOT need less information, right? So it's, it's trying to figure out a system that works for everyone based on what information they need, what they're reporting on, what you need to report on at the county versus what I need at the city level. Yeah, there's this idea that I, I like to talk about where all data is kind of, it's important, but it's not important to everyone. And so finding ways to have those conversations around, you know, what do I need from you um, and what do you need from me and how do we get that sharing to occur um, becomes really important to making sure everybody's on the right track. And there, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think it's on actually multiple levels, this fragmentation on the industry level, I think that construction is a very fragmented industry in regards to using our industry data. Um, but then if you go into an owner organization, you have the different departments and uh, ownership of systems within the departments, but not really across the enterprise. Uh, and then even on the consulting side, uh, most of our project data resides in systems that are owned by our clients. So even if we wanted to use that enterprise level data, we can't because it's residing in so many systems and it's not our data, it's the client's data. So I feel like our industry as a whole is really paying the price for being so uh, fragmented as a whole. Oh, and I think what even compounds it further is in many cases, we're often talking about construction technology, but construction is just a part of your organization's business and how that then ties to that greater picture creates even more fragmentation pain. These tailor-made tools for construction are great at what they do there, but when you're going to connect to your asset and your lifecycle platforms, you probably have some gaps. And I think, uh, Sean, this is a great opportunity to talk about how we're moving forward and some of your strategy. So are you talking cam -Am? Um, no, not cam -Am, but... Uh, Just regular your, strategies? Your strategy in terms of uh, your homegrown solution and how you've been moving away um, to get more close. Got it. So there's a certain benefit to fragmentation. It, it allows you to be a little bit more agile and, and start where you need to start, right? Instead of developing one software system that can do everything for you, it... it from our perspective at an agency, it's it's almost impossible to do, right? So we're, we're taking, trying to find spreadsheets, grouping them up by tasks and saying, okay, we're gonna do a software system for this and then we're gonna come back and do another software system and then try to figure out how we're integrating them. So instead of having one massive, large software system, we're essentially better off using smaller systems, at least from the city of Chicago standpoint, right? I'm not necessarily suggesting this is a one size fits all, but for us, we're finding that we're better off taking the tools that we have and trying to integrate them. So we have a, a permit uh, GIS, uh, Google Maps based system called Dot Maps that we use to track all of our permits, our street moratoriums. So we're gonna have to try to figure out how to integrate that with uh, planning systems and design systems so that we can figure out, okay, well, and, and just in general, we have our uh, arterial resurfacing uh, project manager that sits next to our traffic uh, signal designer, right? And because even though they, talk, they sit next to each other, they don't necessarily talk about what projects they're doing, what locations they're working on, to make sure that one isn't planning on resurfacing an intersection that the other is gonna rip up to put a new traffic signal on, right? So it's trying to find solutions so that we can actually talk internally within our own department and our own divisions to make sure that we're collaborating and not ripping up the same pavement twice, right? Is that something you feel has been kind of accelerated by COVID with how uh, we've moved to remote work in some cases and, and now somewhat in some cases returning back to the office, but like in that effort to move as asynchronously, how are we connecting those processes? Well, so what we've saw during COVID is that we, we weren't necessarily prepared to go full digital yet, but we had to, right? So we, we ended up doing things that were ultimately harder than paper, we went to a PDF solution that we didn't have a full e-signature DocuSign, Adobe Sign type of, of technology. We ended up going with, here's your PDF, figure out how to do your own e-signature. And, and then we always had problems with, well, 
you know, you lock the file. I can't put my own signature on top of it. So now we're we're kind of backtracking a little bit. We we made progress in in that now we all understand that we need it, and now it's trying to figure out the best solution in the future. Paper is great because it's easy for me to print it out, sign it, and hand it to you, and essentially not leave your office until I get your signature. Before what we were doing in COVID is I'd scan it, you know, sign it, scan it, email it to you, and then it sits in your inbox until you get around to reading it. I don't know about the rest of you, but I have about 1,000 unread emails in my inbox right now. I'll get to it when I get to it, until you come and actually bug me for it. That's a, yeah, I've, they'll send me a second email if it's important, Antra. <laughs> yeah. If, if I may just pick up there, and this is something we kind of had a pre-conversation on, but the idea that there are amazing tools, many of which are in the back, you know, um, with the vendors at this conference, There's very, there are very powerful digital tools and project delivery platforms. Um, but I think the point I want to make is that these these tools are still embedded in a process that involves people and interaction from human to human. And what, and that goes along with all the complexities of, of people. And I, I think there there's no one system to, to rule them all, if you will. Um, I, I, I guess... W in order to have a more efficient project delivery. So kick it off, manage it, deliver it, close it out. It involves uh, a, a constant back and forth between people and teams and interacting with these tools. And it's about having the right tool for the job too. Like if I'm managing a project, I don't want a dashboard with 100 metrics when I only need 10 or three. So I mean, maybe that's getting into the, um, there are some project engineers up here or process engineers like maybe that's the work that they do is designing these processes and these systems so that you have the right information delivered in the right way at the right time so we can make better management decisions see so you're not a good <laughs> um, I mean I totally understand that customization today is an absolute must for a large complex owner or a construction project but I also feel that the industry as a whole would really benefit from software solutions that don't uh, uh, require a lot of customization because not every owner is sophisticated enough or willing to spend, make the investment. So what do they end up with? They end up with uh, smart sheets or monday.com and they call it their PMIS system. Uh, so I feel like uh, there are some software products out there that allow uh, their users to actually sell their customization of a workflow, for example, in a shared uh, environment. I feel like that is the one way to, to make our industry better as a whole, that if the city of Chicago invests time in figuring out how to best link their systems to make that accessible for other cities out there that are of the same type of scale. I don't think Oak Park would require <laughs> your type of solution, but there is so much effort being put into customization right now that is really only benefiting one client organization. Well, I think that when these tools are being developed, it is coming from that lens of what do I need and how do I manage my job function and um, in many cases, what I, I, I like about your approach, John, is understanding that what is happening, what, what part of the process do we need to improve, and how do we not think about this platform, silver bullet for everybody? So how do we make that one, one person much more efficient at what they do and much more efficient at communicating with everybody that they touch? Well, we would drown under the weight of, yeah. of the task if we tried to exactly. take it all in at once. Oh, well, that's the other problem with product, too. <laughs> I think one little anecdote there is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good in that you know, there isn't a perfect system, and you kind of have to work with what you have sometimes, and then I think this is where the, the principle of continual process improvement comes in. I think one example, at, at Cook County, I, I inherited a lot of systems that were set up for the purposes of ARPA compliance, which is mission critical. You know, we need to spend our money wisely and in compliance with federal regulations, lest we have the risk of having to pay it back or something. Um, but I find myself kind of hacking the, those systems a little bit for the purposes. It's subtle, but going from risk management and compliance to project management. Um, 
So sometimes we have to work with the systems that we have and sometimes link different things. One other example is for my monthly monitoring meeting for one of my projects, I use Power BI to get a dashboard look at the spend and the program progress. And I use, I get the outputs from my subrecipients Gantt chart of where they're tracking with the progress. And then I have um, some other kind of home built or ground, you know, systems that I've developed and I just PDF and package that together for a, a pretty comprehensive look at where the project is at. So um, I, I guess we could say, well, let's streamline and bring all those systems into one place. And I think that's generally a good design goal, but I, I can't pause progress on the program while we're designing this, this beautiful system. Absolutely. So yeah, I think that you have had exposure to kind of a couple different facets of product deployment from that homegrown. What are some of the things that you see and how they contrast to each other? Uh, between homegrown and uh, off-the-shelf yes. software? Um, well, off-the-shelf software, definitely the functionality, or at least the, f the, the main functionality, becomes uh, usable much quicker because you start out uh, with a PMIS system, for example, and document management really only requires for you to um, get some kind of uh, agreement on the file folder structure while building your own system. Uh, even that basic functionality is going to take a much longer time to, to program uh, and to also go through uh, the stakeholder uh, definition uh, meetings to to actually define to the programming team what the outcome product should uh, perform. Uh, and then uh, it goes into the maintenance aspect of a homegrown solution where uh, you don't really have the benefits from uh, 20,000 other people using the same system every day and uh, them figuring out things of how you can use it better or them figuring out what is actually broke and has not been uh, caught by the software developer yet. Nick, can I, can I ask um, maybe some audience participation? What, what's your feeling on, uh, can I get a show of hands on uh, off the shelf preference versus homegrown? Off the shelf first, homegrown. Interesting, okay. Well, it's fascinating. So Avocado, we did a study with Dodge Construction Network, and it was a kind of similar. We saw that around 31% were using platform solutions, 30% were using off-the-shelf. Uh, 19 uh, had some form of Microsoft solution in place, um, and then it dropped. Microsoft back. being what? Spreadsheets? That is a beautiful question. Right. Um, Microsoft, using Microsoft, as anybody knows, can range from I've opened Excel to I know how to do a pivot table. Um, so that is something that we plan to dig in a bit more, mostly because many of people have Microsoft. And Microsoft is actually a very, very powerful tool um, that we really only use a very, very small portion of. Um, what was fascinating also about this report, however, though, is that around 96%, I believe, of owners felt that they needed to, uh, one of the biggest focus was improving their existing um, infrastructure and technology solutions that they've built. So there is this ownership over that homegrown utility because those things are purpose built for the users in mind, which I'm sure you could uh, add value to and Sean about how that experience has been. Yeah, so I mean, we, we use both off the shelf and homegrown. The off the shelf, you're essentially, you have to follow the rules of, of that software, right? You can't use MicroStation or AutoCAD for word processing. I mean, you could, but you probably don't want to, right? Um, but I think, you know, to your point, what's harder, developing a new system or changing your staff's attitudes and, and process to say, we're going to change our process to fit a mold of a off the shelf uh, as opposed to we're going to customize based on our needs. And, and we're having a hard time with that right now, trying to figure out what the best way forward is. Yeah, I was nodding when you were talking. I've gone through a year of we're, City of Chicago Department of Transportation is looking at a, pro, a full comprehensive program management system, similar to an e-builder or an Astroware or something like that. But we, we've decided to go custom 
custom built at this point. And we've gone, we have 33 user groups. We had our initial one to two hour interview meeting with every single user group. And what we're trying to do is we're taking a paper-based system and we're trying to digitize it. And not just digitize it, but actually bring it into the digital world, which is not just digitizing paper. It's coming up with what do we no longer need because it's a digital system. We don't need transmittal letters. We don't need you know, who, signatures of who needs to sign next because we can all embed that into digital workflows. So we're essentially, we're taking something that we've never actually done before, which is actually work, you know, prepare workflows for all of our processes so that we can design it internally. And I gotta say, it's a bear. It's a bear, but I think there's something really beautiful about that approach because it's forcing your team to actually dig into the process and identify what does it mean to create material in this new digital future because it is different, I'm sure, from handling paper. And there's well, and it, it's hard because it's like, oh, I made a mistake. Give me that sheet of paper back, right. and I'll make a change, as opposed to rejecting it back and trying to actually create a workflow for. Wait a minute, I need to recall this. Mm. And I just want to point out there are some risks with that transition. Like I'm thinking of the QA, QC process. And um, yes, there's a risk with having a, a human look at a plan set and redline it and, and make comments. But there's coming from a firm that really prioritized digital first and being moving away from paper based QA, QC processes, like it's possible to miss things. You know, it just, it is in the digital space, it is in the, the handwritten space, but maybe there's a, a balance between the two. And maybe that goes back to a comment I made earlier, which is you have these digital processes that are connected to these human driven workflows. Well, and I think what's interesting about that is in many cases, when we think about automation and how um, all of this is going to say, you know, eliminate a job perhaps, or change the way we work completely, or make it so easy to say, hey, these 80 submittals are good, I don't even need to look at them, and then what slips through is understanding that um, you're doing that kind of process exploration, saying, well, where, where are the bottlenecks that we actually want to have so that we're doing the right quality checks and adopting a kind of that QA mindset through what can we automate in this process? What can we chop out? And I think that's where you're going, Sean, is like, yeah, ultimately, when we go with a digital solution, I want to make my job easier, right? As the end user, I want something to be easier. But what I'm finding is that I'm just trading one type of work for another type of work. Because then once you create a database, you have to manage the database. You have to manage the data that's in it. And then you have to go back to you know your staff and your consultants and say, there's data that's missing here, and I need it in order for this workflow to move forward. So all we're really doing is trading one set of tasks for another set of tasks. Absolutely. And I, or I know we're getting started close to the end here. Time flies when you're on stage. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that I want to dig in more on that exact topic around the data is just what are the things that we need to see from the industry so that we can start to get some of that consistency? We talked about the fragmentation from local to federal, across vendors. Um, what do we need to start seeing to be able to mobilize that data better? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, but I, I want to pick up with something you said, which is um, file folder structure. It's something that will, will make all of our eyes glass over. But something as mundane as naming files and data and standards and um, just the terms, like even in a spreadsheet, are we using the exact same term to describe that geography or that project type? That's so important because that's at the the core of having more interoperable systems across those scales or between public and private sector, especially if you get into P3s, that's another conversation. But um, I'm coming off of a, there's a conference in Chicago several weeks ago, Shared Use Mobility Center, and there's whole technical sessions on just having the same terms for how we refer to transportation related data. And that allows these systems to talk to each other. So I think that's one thing we need is more standards around how we um, organize and structure our data so that it can flow whether through APIs or other types of integrations across platforms. And maybe that's scary for a lot of businesses. I, I worked on a project years ago where we got Uber and Via and MoveIt, which was kind of a back-end mobility as a service provider to share data. and in some ways, companies don't want to do that because they want to control their their customer. Um, but I think we're moving in, into a more 
technology agnostic world and that will allow more seamless integrations of, of projects and the data that we're collecting and hopefully lead to better projects and bigger impacts. It's this weighing of pluses and minuses that comes with standardization. Uh, we talked in the, uh, in the area outside with one of the vendors and it's looking at P6, which basically has a monopoly in scheduling and CPM scheduling, which makes it really easy for the industry to exchange scheduling files. It's all in the same format. Uh, it can be in integrated just within seconds. And then you have program management information systems and you have probably 100 products right now that will never be standardized. And therefore, we will always be uh, not capable of exchanging information as quickly and without customization that are building on these tools uh, like we do with, e with P6. But then with P6, we also held hostage as a... <laughs> as an industry to one vendor either investing money and further developing it or what they are charging us for using it. So uh, so do, do we maybe embrace that and then start saying, okay, we're never going to get rid of that. So then are our APIs the solution or our inter software communications the, the, you know, the best way to go? I think that's something that we'll uncover as we continue to push on the boundaries of things. Um, you see there are new scheduling tools that emerge. Um, you have your Mondays, Asanas, and whatnots that are, act as scheduling tools as well. Um, and there's even other tools like Elucent that are trying to pull in pull planning and build in that people process into how we manage our projects. And so... I think these conversations are typically what drive it. Um, I think this is the exciting time to talk a little bit about CAMAM, but um, we as practitioners in this industry can influence directly these, the technology vendors who are here to support and enable our business. And I think having those open conversations of across stakeholders as either federal, this is the information I need in order to do my job best, and contractor, that's the information they need to do their job best, who's responsible for authoring at what times um, and getting those conversations into contract language and into our technology so we can identify those fields that are missing, that's where we start to connect those dots. Um, that's where we start to look at an asset as it's authored in planning and measure it after it's delivered. But that data currently gets lost through the game of telephone or is not updated. And, much of this is the nature of all of us just trying to do the best job we can with the amount of resources and time that we have. Um, but how do we then start to change our relationship with the tools that we use to get those results? Yeah, so what we're doing at the, I guess maybe north of 80 on the in Illinois, we're looking at, we've created a group called CAMAM, so it's Construction and Materials Asset Management. And so it's, uh, it's FHWA, IDOT, both Central Office and, and District 1, uh, Illinois Tollway, uh, I think it's six counties, Cook, DuPage, Lake, McHenry, uh, Will, and I'm probably missing at least one other one, and then the city of Chicago. So what we're doing is we're looking at all of the agencies in the area, in the Chicagoland area, and we're trying to come up with uh, the same requirements so that when we go to a hall hub for e-ticketing or a uh, any other kind of system, we're like, these are the fields that all of us want. So it's not every single person on this panel wants different different data fields from, from a company and then requiring customization at every single level. So we're trying to say everyone in the Chicagoland area, obviously knowing that Illinois is different than Wisconsin and Michigan, we're all going to have slightly different specifications and requirements. But at least if we can agree on a statewide level, these are the requirements that we need from a system, I think that, that just makes it a little easier to figure out what we want. And I know Nick and I were talking earlier that that's just on the agency side, right? And then there's different systems that contractors use on their side to administer the same construction project that we have. So we're going to have to figure out what the agency requirements are and the contractor and the consultant requirements. And that's almost a, it, it's one thing to integrate agency requirements. It's a whole nother to integrate other parts of the same work. 
Yeah, and that's we, that's what we were talking about is like that lack of clarity or someone's getting information a little bit late. We tend to communicate from our perspective, and so I know it, so you must know it too. And then that's unfortunately how we get wrong specifications on things and, and, and surprises on projects. And so finding ways to sit down and talk to the, our vendors and say, okay, you know, how can we set you up with the information that we've built from our planning or our previous projects? to help you be more successful? What are the things that maybe you need to be procuring right now because we know that the light lead time is long because we just finished a project last week and I had to wait X amount of months. Um, how do we leverage that intelligence to then drive better insights on our projects? Um, with that, we're kind of at the end of the time. Is there anything either of you'd like to add? I think final thoughts would be, I'm open to discussions, right? I, I know that, it's it's tough to change our process from paper to digital. I'm open to it. There's a lot of other people at the city of Chicago, the Cook County that I've talked to. We're open to discussions, so we'd like to have the discussions with our consultants and our software partners. So let's continue the conversation. Obviously, we're not going to figure this all out today. Really, really quick. Um, it's tough, any digital transition, um, but it's... We, we need to do it because the volume, well, right now the volume of funding that needs to be administered requires that we make our systems more e efficient and that we could track things more closely, but also the volume of need, you know, that we see on the ground, it, it, it requires that we um, improve our systems so we could deliver um, projects on time, on budget, um, to specification and all those I'm not going to call them value adds, things like resilience and equity. It's not value add. Those are embedded in on time and on budget and to spec and with the staff that we have. And I think uh, examples like Sean's about multiple public agencies working together, I think that's exactly what the industry needs to kind of take down the walls that separate us and bring uh, uh, owners and consultants together to, to benefit from the overall data that we own. It's a massive amount of data and it's sitting out there uh, largely underutilized. Um, so to do that, uh, and also as an industry, to be quicker to adopt uh, uh, new technology. I feel like we always 10 to 15 years behind other industries. So that needs to change. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, InfraDay, for giving us the stage today and to the audience for hanging out with us. You know, it's been a long day, and we appreciate it. So um, thank you. Thank you.